and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And this is new for me. Um, after a week of trying to figure out how to make Zoom work so that you could see both Carla and myself at the same time, we finally, um, with the help of the wonderful handsome Dan, got it fixed today. And we are going to do our best at bringing you at least one show a week. Who knows, maybe if something pressing happens, we could do more. Um, we can't Facebook Live this because we can't do both at the same time, uh, but we will be posting this on the Facebook page um, as soon as it's done rendering when we're done. So, uh, jumping right in, um, the last time Carla and I taped, I think we said, oh, we don't wanna talk about COVID-19 or something like that. Um, now, there's no way to avoid really talking about it. Um, we're obviously in two weeks time, so much has changed. We went from, the restaurants and bars being closed down, which is a real hit to uh, the restaurant and bar industry in New Hampshire. Um, I felt really, really bad because it happened the day before St. Patrick's Day. Um, then we went on to, you know, lots of stay at home warnings and all that type of stuff. And then just last week, um, Governor Sununu issuing the all non-essential businesses be closed. And it, it, it is a challenge to balance um, keeping people from getting this virus with the economic impacts. And I find myself really struggling. I'm not on one side or the other. I take the virus very seriously. I do think it is worse than the flu. I don't think this is something to take lightly. I don't want to get it. Um, I don't think I'm at risk, but you know, I you read story. I've been reading more and more stories about younger people who've gotten it, um, people who are relaying stories about other people who have become very ill. Um, it's just not something I think I'm ready to just brush off as. Oh no, it's just media hype. I do think the media is hyping. Well, I I agree with that, right? So let's let's assume for the sake of argument this is a serious situation. Yep. I think undoubtedly that's the case. The question though, however, becomes even in a situation like that, what liberties or rights do you give up? And you know, what rights does the governor or the president have to do with free people? So I read a really compelling take on this, which I really liked and I wanted to talk to you about. And that was, you know, the way rights work is a right is something that as a solution to violate, you should take off the table. So your right to keep and bear arms means that no one can take that right away. Now that's not how it currently works anymore, but that's how it's supposed to work. So the right, you know, our First Amendment, which everyone thinks about as a free speech right, right, but it's also the right to assemble, it's the right to religion. I mean, one of the interesting things in Governor Sununu's order was it also said churches have to close yeah. down. And so, you know, these are actual 100% violations of our constitutional rights. So I've been really interested in looking at, you know, at this from a perspective of, hey, if I was governor, it's really easy to sit here and to be like, well, I don't <laughs> like the way you're doing things, sir. Yeah. So I've been thinking about, hey, if I was governor, like, how would I approach this? Right. And I think, uh, you know, to Chris's credit, I actually think he's done a pretty good job. The only difference All things that considered, I would have right? Done, is I would have made everything that he is doing an advisory. I think it is the role of the government to try and give us as much good information as possible. But if you're someone like me who believes that we do actually have fundamental rights and that the government does not own me, then the government cannot, short of martial law, in which case that is an entirely different scenario and something that you know is, is worthy of exploring down the line, they don't actually have the right to tell you where you can and can't go. Right. They also, you know, if you look at, I, I jokingly posted this yesterday, I'm redoing like famous quotes from literary works, right? And there's that famous quote from Animal Farm written by George Orwell in the 40s, talking about, you know, sort of totalitarianism and author, author, authoritarianism and all of that, right? And the quote was always, um, all animals are equal. Some animals are just more equal than others. Right. And the background to that, of course, was that, you know, they had this farm and everyone was equal. And then the power mad control freak 
uh, in this case, they were little piggies, you know, start carrying whips. And then eventually they say, we're all equal, but we're more equal than you. So my remake of that was, you know, some, some animals are essential. All animals are essential. Some animals are more essential than others. Right. Now, I don't, you know, I, I mean that bitingly because I think that there is a problem if we look at the role of the state and if the state is willing to say to people, you're essential and you're not essential. And I think Sununu, to his credit, has made that list broad and long and yes. as easy as possible for businesses to try and do. But, you know, I'm a lady and I talk to my lady friends and everyone is going, what about my nails? What right. about my hair? And I understand that those are, you know, first world problems, but they're legit. So this is, this is something that I don't claim to have the answer on because I, prior to this new order closing non-essential businesses, um, the woman who I go to for my pedicures was starting to scale back and she was really struggling with what to do. Should she continue working? Because obviously she needs an income. You know, people don't go to work just for fun. And I, she was, you know, like not really sure what to do because she's self-employed. She, you know, she has, had limited things. So I wonder if part of the declaration that, you know, non-essential businesses are closed has something to do with um, the ability for self-employed people or people, you know, say you work for a company, I'm going to use my, where I work, we weren't clo really closed and we're definitely not essential in my view where, you know, we make window treatments. I don't think anybody's drapery is essential. Um, but what if you work for an employer who just will not close and you're kind of forced, I mean, nobody's forced, you can choose to stay home, but you're still not probably eligible for unemployment if you, ch of your own free will, just stop going to work. So there was that weird thing that I wonder if part of it wasn't to trigger um, the ability for people to get unemployment. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I, I the back. In the back of my brain, I think it may have. Now, on a similar note, which I found was interesting, when um, when they closed the restaurants, I was talking with Keith Murphy because Dan and I make it our point, and everybody who's watching this should make it a point to, if you can, if you're if you're not struggling financially, to support your local businesses, get takeout. You know, even if it's once a week, we make it a point of getting Murphy's once a week. We try to go to Casey's Rib Shack. You know, we're trying to support the little local restaurants that are that we love that are struggling. And Keith and I were talking about um, his insurance and he has um, insurance to cover all sorts of reasons why his business would have to close. Being shut down by the government, it wasn't one of them. So that kind of stinks too, because you're paying this insurance to cover your loss of you know, I mean, you, you might be able to make an act of God argument that no, it's more severe, that's what, but that's excluded usually as that's well. That's what he said. He so. goes, how is, how is a virus not an act of God? And that is a good point. So there's like always whenever anything on any of these decisions are made, you know, I've been trying to, you know, one thing I keep reminding my uh, more conservative friends who seem to be very outraged with Chris Sununu these days is I keep reminding people that we could be doing this under Molly Kelly. And if you think it's um, overreach now, I'm pretty sure that Molly Kelly would have been far more overreaching than Chris Sununu has been. Um, I think Chris is, you know, doing the best he can with the bad situation that's dropped on him. I mean. So, so let's focus on some of the good things. First of all, with the restaurants, I did want to mention the union leader did say today that they are looking for reviews from people for their favorite restaurants that are currently still serving. So oh. if you have a, you know, if you see this and you're like, oh, I love this place. I don't want it to go out of business. How can I help? That's awesome leader leave a short little review they're going to put those up to try and help local businesses so i think that's great that's awesome um, you know uh, a, another positive for me quite frankly is this distance learning i realize and appreciate that this is going to be tough you know it's a tough steep learning curve yep. But some of the positives that I saw, first of all, this week, Chris Sununu did say, we are not going to do any of the standardized federal testing. I think that is a plus and a positive. I think the more people look at the situation and say, what do we not need the federal government right. for? 
Right. And I think the answers become more and more clear as little as possible. You know, even something like all the Massachusetts folks who apparently, you know, part of the reason some of these decisions were being made was apparently to stave off <laughs> the onslaught of the mass holes. Right, right. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and so, you know, we could have, Chris, half jokingly said, I don't have the right to close the borders. I'm like, you could under certain circumstances, just saying. So the distance learning with the education, I think is, is exciting. I think that that might actually, you know, become a model that we can expand on more. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, for some families, and I've heard from, you know, I have a lot of friends who homeschool, so for them that was an adjustment. I also have a lot of friends where the, the mothers are the professionals, they love going to work, they don't want to be at home 24 seven, it's hard for them. And, you know, and that's the thing that we have to realize. Everyone is different. You know, I was on an airplane uh, flying back from somewhere, you know, in the past six months, uh, maybe from Mexico, I think. And I was standing at the loo at the back of the airplane and I was looking down the cabin and everyone had a, a, a camera, you know, the TV on the back of their seats. There was not one person on that airplane that was watching the same thing. Right. That is how different and unique we as individuals are. And so there's one size all fits all solution that we're also seeing applied to this crisis is actually wrong. You know, my perspective is less government will give us better solutions, right? Sure. So as we look at, I mean, the real virus here is the social media, quite frankly, right? But, you know, we are seeing that the information is coming out and people are adapting their decisions and their risk for appetite and exploring different ways. And some people are saying herd immunity, but that should be how it would work in a free society. We would collect as much information. And then if our view of the world is correct, meaning that we can get some kind of, um, you know, a beautiful sort of pattern out of the chaos of all of these little people making decisions, then we're going to make the right decision. And so that's how we should have approached this. You know, instead of saying there's this one solution, we should say, hey, everyone needs to figure out for themselves what their risk appetite is. And a lot of businesses in the end, if no one was going to the businesses because you personally decided your risk you were risk averse and you're like, you know what, I'm just not going to go to, I don't know, the Manchester Republican meeting this month, right? right. Then people would, the, the businesses would decide based on the way people are reacting. So once again, you know, I just wish but, we had done it. But I am going to say this. I am going to say this. So when they first closed the restaurants, which was the day before St. Patrick's Day, Massachusetts had already closed theirs. And I was, you know, like I said, I've been struggling, balance, trying to balance my perspective on this. And I did, if we're honest and upfront, now granted, maybe we didn't have enough information to make this decision on our own, but some of this happened very quickly. I mean, I don't think anybody, I, none of us were taking this virus super seriously before March. Not really. We were saying, oh, there's going to be this virus, all this stuff. Um, Come March, people start, we started getting more information and they started setting up, you know, the testing stuff. Um, but here it was the day before St. Patrick's Day, which we all know is when an insane amount of people flock to restaurants and bars to drink themselves silly in the name of Irish, which, okay, fine. Nothing, nobody I know, even the restaurateurs that I know are responsible, was doing anything to tamper that, to say... I don't want 300 people crammed into my restaurant. I'd like to say, stay safe and have only 50 people. At, nobody was doing that because we really weren't taking it seriously. So there's part Who of me. We though. No, the, the collective we. I'm not saying you and I. I'm saying there wasn't a single restaurant owner who was prior to this shutdown doing anything to reduce the risk in their restaurants. Now I have friends that were in Florida recently on vacation and they said down there, all of the restaurants had um, no seating at certain tables so that nobody was sitting close to each other. So there, you know, maybe every other table, but there wasn't anybody in New Hampshire doing that because I think, I do think our, na our natural tendency in the climate, in the society we actually live in pre COVID-19 is a capitalist one. We all want to make money. 
and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes our but our desire was suggested. Like I feel like had the governor maybe gone and said, "Okay, these are the best practices that we see happening." Nobody would have done it for St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, nobody maybe. would have. And I mean, all those I people from Massachusetts out. would have flocked to Manchester, and I can guarantee the numbers. I looked up the numbers today on the city website. Instead of having this many people infected, we'd probably have more. Um, so well, I, you know, it's I know. not. There's no. There, I agree. There is no one size fits all at all. And I do wish we were making more of these decisions um, on our own. I know for myself, I probably could have continued working. It seemed wrong to me. If we're saying non-essential businesses should stay home, and the emphasis really is on the stay home, um, do, do I really need to go in and do office manager tasks for a place that does drapery? If I'm not if I'm not willing to stay home and you know bite the bullet like everybody else, then I don't know that anybody else is. So I, you know, that's part of the reason why um, I encouraged our company to close for the duration till May 4th or whatever it is. Um, those who are watching, if you are unemployed, if you're self-employed and not working, all these different scenarios, everybody's now part-time, full-time, pretty much everybody's eligible for unemployment insurance. Where this money's coming from, I have no idea. I'm not gonna worry about that in the month of April. Um, there is supposedly money coming from the federal government, which is absolutely insane if it is actually what they say. So everybody on unemployment is gonna make an extra $600 a week. I, I mean, insane. To, just to, to be frank, I mean, from a from a purely economic standpoint, I mean, on a federal level, if we're talking about the two point three trillion dollar right. uh, stimulus stimulus package that you know has now been passed, uh, what I find interesting about this package this time, you know, when we so I've been in America for almost twenty five years now, mm -hmm. I guess, came in ninety six, right? So twenty three, and. Um, so I went through the 1990, the 2000 crash, yep. dot com crash. Yep. Ten years later, 2008 ish, went through that crash. Now we're going through this crash, right? So you can keep stimulating money, right. right? But what we're seeing now here, in my opinion, in any event, is this is this. So last time they bailed out the banks. They bailed out Wall Street and they didn't bail out Main Street. And Main right. Street was very angry. We saw Occupy, we saw the Tea Party, we saw all of that, right? Then we saw the government's reaction to that. And now that's getting bigger. So this time they were like, ooh, we can't just bail out Wall Street because nope. Main Street's getting a little feisty. So yes, now we're gonna get these checks, right? A thousand two hundred dollars mm -hmm. uh, stimulus to I'll every get, person. I'll get twelve hundred dollars. I think Dan will get two fifty because you know he works for a living. <laughs> you know, and then and then we have this unemployment insurance. So really, what we're talking about is we've created a unsustainable national debt. You yep. know, if I talk about how can New Hampshire have more independence, that's another thing that you know Granite Staters should understand. We are net payers to the federal government. Yep. New Hampshire taxpayers give more money to the federal government than we get back. Whether you know the Democrats have rejected the forty-six million for the schools, right. which I'm sure they're going to regret. Or not, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so now we put all this money, we give them money, we don't even get all that money back, and we're liable. You know, the national debt per person is about $72,000 yeah. at this stage. So, you know, when you're paying your bills at the end of the month, keep in mind this free money. Nothing's is, free. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I really am deeply, deeply troubled, and I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope I'm wrong. So, I, I am not sure I am. Transitioning from that and the debt and the government and all this stuff, I said to Dan this morning, one of the things that I do hope comes out of this, and it's either going to happen significantly, I think, or it's just going to blow up and be worse than it is now, is that I hope people start thinking about um, what their government does and doesn't do. For instance, in Manchester. So when this all started happening and Pete, the first round of when the restaurants closed and we started closing things, um, the aldermen in Manchester voted to continue to pay city employees who weren't working. Now, I have no problem with paying teachers because I can't even imagine what it's like trying to be a teacher. It took me two weeks to figure out how to get Zoom to work. I can't even imagine how long it takes them. But 
the teachers are still doing a job, whether we, you know, think it's sufficient or not, that's irrelevant. They're doing the best they can with the situation they have. There are obviously people, you know, picking up trash. There are, there are jobs that are still happening. The libraries are closed. Oh, Trash. <laughs> I know you are, but you know what I mean? They're still picking up your trash. They're doing trash collection, all that stuff. But if we're not, if the libraries are closed, are we still paying all of that library staff? Because it's oh, not yeah. that I want to deprive them of their livelihood, but all of us that are non-essential, because I'm sorry, a library is not essential, are home filing for unemployment. I really think government workers should be treated the same as the regular average Joe. And I also think now is the worst time, and I'm looking at you, Mayor Craig, um, to be suggesting that we increase our city budget by millions of dollars and increase people's property taxes. I mean, this is- Oh yeah, our property is, taxes are going up. I'm not insane. paying my property taxes for every day that we're closed. Well, I mean, and I, I get that like the fire department still exists, the police department still exists, they're still picking up Have my trash. Have you noticed that there are no sirens? Because nobody's off? calling, because half of, I swear half of our sirens were all for things that are nuisance calls and nothing major. But I look at this and I'm like, if our city budget is gonna increase by like $3 million, and then the schools, they wanna give the schools $4 million more dollars. I don't know, I think right today, just like the rest of the people, I think now is when the city should be tightening their belts cutting off all unneeded expenditures. You know, if it means we give money to Girls Inc. normally, maybe we can't, maybe we need to find a, pub, a private solution to funding Girls Inc. I just don't think that asking people in 2020 to plan on paying more money in their mortgage payment every month, which means more rent every month, while they're on unemployment and unsure of when they're actually going to be able to go back to work and how we're ever going to survive all this financially, now is the worst time for government to say, hey, but we think we should spend seven or eight more million dollars a year. I, I, well, I, that really blows that, my mind. But what, but what they're saying, right, so, so I, I would encourage people to just, you know, sort of pay attention and sort of look for the cognitive dissonance, look for sort of the do as I say, but not as I do opportunities. So one of the things we keep hearing, right, is this idea of, you know, we must, we're all in this together. Right. And we must all sacrifice. But some of us are in it together more. <laughs> but, but, you know, we're back to the original quote that we started with, right? So, so people are telling us to sacrifice, but they are unwilling to do it themselves. Right. Not only is our, are our property taxes going up, there is a secret teacher's contract that was negotiated over the weekend that is being uh, ratified tonight at an emergency city meeting. Where there's no After public input. Years where there was no contracts. There's no place for public input. I, you know, the, the, so the fine print on this, I printed it out, is so fine that I can't see it. The one thing I could read was that, you know how you always hear that uh, the poor teachers have to spend their own money on school supplies? Yes. Did you know that they actually get, now they get $600 a year per teacher for school supplies. It used to be 500, it went up by $100. Right. So every time from now on, do as you say, not as you do, you hear someone like, oh, I can't afford school supplies. $600 That's for a lot of stuff. like unlimited, you know, no one's checking what you're buying, you know, it's, it's, that's a lot of money. So I'm not going to buy that anymore. So the liquor stores, you know, one of the things I've heard a lot is, you know, we, we have to make these sacrifices. And if it saves only one life, right, which is a nonsense statement. I mean, but you know, let's not even get into that. Um, the liquor stores, if we want to save only one life, close down the liquor stores. Alcohol is really bad for you. Let's bring back prohibition. I'm Don't being sarcastic. liquor stores. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, but you understand you what I'm saying. Like, like we're doing all these things and we're causing an economic crash because we don't really know what's going on and then we're pretending it's for the safety of people. But we have all these unsafe things in the world that we've already sort of internalized that we're willing to live with these risks. So I understand we're trying to do that with this new scary thing. But let's not lose sight of the fact that the liquor stores are open and 
they are going to get a 10% raise. Temporary though. I did read it is temporary. I'm not defending it, I, but I did read that it was temporary, which made me feel a little bit better because there are understaffed and overworked or whatever. I, I, I'm not saying I'm making excuses. But for do you understand them- how economics work? So here's how economics work. There are currently a lot of unemployed people, which means the price should go down for labor, not go up for labor. But when you're dealing with the government, it will always go up. I know. So I set the timer for 25 minutes and you and I wondered how we were going to fill a, fill a show up like this, right? Um, we're almost out of time. Well, we're almost out of 25 minutes. So we can, we have a few minutes to wrap up. Um, I do want to emphasize to people that, um, you know, if you can stay home, stay home. I'm not really sure a hundred percent what, like, I'm going to be bad and go out this afternoon. I'm meeting up with Matt Mayberry to go thank, wave at people over at CMC and thank them for the hard work that they're doing because they have probably the worst job. Yes, I can't there. Um, they have the worst job ever. I would not want to be in the medical profession. Um, so we're, I'm going to go do that. And then, um, but I was like, wow, we have to be really careful. Should I wear a mask? Because I know you and you guys go out, you wear masks. And I think I might almost start wearing a mask just to remind people that it's okay that if we have to wear masks, if that's what prevents the spread of this virus. Um, so I'm going to go do that. That's my rebel in me today. But other than that, I really am just staying home. I went to the grocery store last week. I went to Walmart and I was like, yeah, I don't really think I need to go to Walmart again. It was kind of, eh. and people are crazy. Um, and people aren't getting the social distancing. Don't get, get don't get up in people's space. I don't know why they're doing that. Um, so, you know, stay home, try to stay healthy. Um, try not to spend too much time reading all the reports every day. There's a, you know, press conference. Um, they are talking about the spike, which Dan follows the numbers. You know, he's another one like John DiPietro that knows all the exponential growth and all that stuff that I just don't have the brain space to fill. Um, they are predicting maybe 18th to 25th of the month might be when New Hampshire like tops out unfortunately with cases and deaths and it'll be kind of sad. I did refresh. I have those worldometer thing. If you go to worldometer.com um, where you can see all, anywhere in the country and you can see state by state where you're at and it's fairly accurate. And I realized this morning I hadn't refreshed it and it was set to us. And when I opened the screen, it said 1,046 deaths. And then I refreshed and it said 4,036. And I thought, Uh oh, that's a big difference. (laughs) Yeah, but the thing is also putting it in context, I would love to see that counter right next to seasonal flu counter so that we can just keep things in context. I'd like to end with, I have a recommendation for 10 steps people can take to have a a, a better experience and to really just take charge of their life. That's on my website, carlagarrick.com. And it's things from, you know, meditating to cooking with your family and just taking this time to actually regroup and become a better human being. That's what I think I'm doing too. So we will be back maybe between now and next week, but um, this will be playing on our TV show and I'll post it on Facebook later on today after I'm done being a rebel with Matt Mayberry. Um, Please, by all means, stay safe, stay healthy. Try not to let stress get the best of you because we will get through this and somehow or another, we will all survive. Um, That's all I got. Bye. Bye.